are tired, so let me go. Yeah. So why do we do it? Because they're great to taste. They're really expensive and they don't stay fresh long. But the, And the plants live a long time and they do stay productive. A lot of people don't know the difference between a raspberry or blackberry. When you pull off, if you're out in the garden at six o'clock in the morning and you're, you know, checking on your berries and you, you pull them off, you always end up leaving the receptacle there. Um, a blackberry, the whole thing comes off. Now, this is, this is kind of very basic, but it's very important. They all raspberries, no matter whether they're summer bearing or um, ever bearing, they have roots that come back year after year roots and crown but the canes are biennial they come up the new canes come up the first year and they're called primocanes they're green real pretty and green then comes winter the second year those primocanes are the ones that are going to have flowers therefore floricanes they have flowers and fruit and they all oh, those canes the canes that come up die after two years so once they have fruited um, well, once they have their two years, once they're two years, they die. Flora canes, the second year canes, always die after producing a crop of berries. Now, this is important. Berries only form on the little, little branches that form off the main cane, not on the cane itself. And they don't like hot, dry weather greater than 80 degrees during fruiting. And I had a heck of a time last year and the year before and the year before. And I, I get to the point where I'm not sure raspberries are a good crop to grow here. This is just a kind of a very busy slide, but it tells you how the summer bearing and ever bearing different. Now, the first year, if you planted them this spring, the primocane comes up and there are no fruit, no nothing on it. Um, the, you're not going to have a floor cane, um, but in the next year, that primocane will become the floricane, right? And it's going to give you fruit. It's going to be wonderful. And then it dies at the end of the season. And the next, and while that was growing, new ones were coming up. Those new ones coming up now become the fruit bearers and new ones are growing and so on. Now, the difference is the ever bearing, it, it, or the ever bearing are the ones they also call them fall bearing. The primocane and growth uh, grow on the the veg. Oh, geez, come on. The the fruit and the flowers and the fruit grow on the tip of the branches in late summer, the first year, as opposed to the summer bearing, which don't. Um, now the floricane, the one that uh, had the flowers on that first year. The tip dies back, so you'll chop that off, and then it may, it may or may not fruit again in June or July, but it's a second year for that cane. It's going to die. Meanwhile, while this was happening, while you were getting fruit, the new primocanes were forming and so on. And we'll talk about how to manage both of these. So this is what an ever-bearing raspberry looks like, and, and we'll talk about the pruning methods I personally just chop mine down, the ever bearing only at the end of the year. But this is what it would look like in spring. This is the flora cane that gave you that early spring harvest. You chop it off. Later in summer, if you're lucky, you'll get some berries on little branches. And then in the fall, mind you, see, you can see the primocane coming up, the brand new babies. At the end of this year, since it's the second year for it, this one dies, cut it down. And in the fall, the whole thing starts again. I cut it to the ground because that's the way to go, but they didn't. They're leaving it there and in the, you leave this whole thing for next year and you will get some uh, tip growth and, and fruiting. Confusing, isn't it? So we have some native raspberry um, species where I lived before, I was lucky enough to be able to go out my door and they were growing in the, uh, scrub right at the edge of the forest. So our salmon berries, which never lasted long enough to get really ripe because the birds got them. Same thing with the thimble berry. I love thimble berry, but the um, salmon berry has really pretty pink flowers. 
So here are some summer bearing ones that you might want to try. And I've tried Tulamine and Cascade Delight. They're both really large fruits, especially Tulamine. The Tulamine is about, oh, a good inch and a half. It, it's wonderful. The Cascade Delight was, it says the um, size that feeds the Tulamine, but not in my garden. And I'll explain why I'm not getting that good. A lot of people like Meeker, but this Cascade Delight and Meeker are some of the best summer bearing ones here. Cascade Gold is another good one. And I, I don't have any um, anything to say about these. I don't know anything about them. Something that you want to be uh, very mindful of you want to look at the second column, or I second column on this one. Um, are they resistant to things? Um, Cascade Delight is tolerant to root rot, susceptible to viruses, and Pulamine, I lost some. It's very prone to root rot. And the problem with those is with strawberry or raspberries in general, they are tolerant. They, do get root rot if they have wet feet. So be really careful about that. So, and make sure again, that you look very carefully at what they, you know, what their uh, resistance is. Red and yellow, black or purple. Okay, so they make a real case about this um, four to seven. They say that, the, uh, the raspberries that grow in these colder places, four to seven, for example, zones four to seven, hardiness zones, they, we may not up here where we live in zone eight, we may not have cold enough um, cool time for them to, to do well. On the other hand, and, and ours won't do well where they are because the extreme temperatures and the um, and the wind will get them. Now the black or purple raspberries, which we're not really going to be talking about much because and there's a limit of what we can do there. The jewel would be a really good one to grow here. It's specific for our area. And then we have the other two that will do well here too. And these are the fall bearing. And I have Anne growing, and if I had read what it said about Anne, Anne is better for um, four to seven, and I'm eight, four to seven hardiness zone, and I'm eight. And it's just, it's okay, but it's not great. It's in an uh, area where it's sheltered, which means it's probably not getting enough winter cold. Okay or selecting a site full sun. Avoid places where you've had tomatoes, um, strawberries, peppers grown because they those can bear a, um, a soil dwelling organism called verticillium wilt and that can transfer to your berries as well. And most of us have clay soil. The soil has to have excellent drainage. So if you are going to grow in clay soil, which I am, the, these are my rows, um, create a mound, create a raised bed. There are two different way, kinds of raised beds. This is one, and the other one is where you have them contained on the side by you know, bricks or, or wood. Uh, so make sure that you've got mounds that are at least a foot and a half high so that they'll be able to drain well. If you're going to plant, you have to start in the fall by getting the soil ready. You want to get organic matter, the shredded leaves, compost, uh, and get them into the soil. Check your pH. You may want to lime. On this side, you may want to lime. On the other side of, of the mountains where the soil's alkaline, you may, you may want to um, you may want to put uh, elemental sulfur in to get it a little bit more acid. Support options. Most people I know use the wire system. I don't use this 
most uh, if you if mine if I tried freestanding, which I sort of did this fall because I didn't take care of it, they go everywhere, everywhere, and they will grab you with their thorns as you walk by and complain. So, um, support options: all plants should be at least two feet apart, and this is for the um, hedgerows. And hedgerows meaning you can see the picture of the hedgerow. They are trimmed like hedges. And um, most people, I don't think most people do that here. And maybe some people do. But the rows should be eight feet apart. Lots of room here. And the rows should only be six to 12 inches wide, right? That's really, really narrow. Um, and the other important thing is you've got to keep all these errant uh, chronic canes that want to come up in the middle, you've got to get rid of those and any weeds as well. I would suggest using something like arborist wood chips, chips like three to four, five, six inches between them. It's a good place to walk and it keeps the weeds down, although those raspberries starts will want to come up, but they're easy to pull out. And there are a couple different ways that you can uh, train them. I've got three wires. I've got one at about oh mid thigh level. I've got another one at chest level, and I probably I have one at probably five foot six at my head level. And that's because I didn't trim them down like I probably should have. I think if I were going to do it again, I'd do it at three feet and then at five feet and then chop the tops off and not let them get any taller. Now, there's a, let's see, there, that was the hedgerow system. This is the hill system, and the hill system has nothing to do with a hill. It only means that the plants are treated as individuals, and this is pretty much what I've done, except I'm learning as I go, and I, I, I'm, I need to go back out there and do a little bit more trimming. So you train, you treat each one like an individual plant, and they can have a foot and a half on, um, wide row because they're going to be able to expand a little bit. Each plant is going to be able to expand, but you're going to prune off any suckers that come up between them so that they'll be individual plants. This is what they look like after you've pruned them in the uh, fall and, and finished off in the spring to get them at about five feet. Planting, that's really important. And they're planted a little bit different from um, most plants. Make sure that you buy certified disease-free plants from a nursery. Don't take starts from, from a friend. Um, they, you could have a virus there. You could end up with some, something else. You really don't want that. So bare root is best. And it, you should be planting them in early as early spring into soil that you prepared last year. And the bare root is the best way to go. Um, the pots, once they've been in pots and you pick them up somewhere, they're starting, the roots are starting to circle. Um, you will have a much healthier plant, both um, apple trees, pear trees, peach trees, and uh, raspberries if you plant bare root. Heal them in if you can't get them planted right away, you know, put them in a, a raised bed that you've got or saw, damp sawdust and just let them sit there until you can get there. And because the um, raspberries have those long, long um, root systems, you should spread them out like hair, it, um, pull some soil away, spread them out like hair uh, so that they're about two to three inches below the ground and cover that. The, um, the roots have little buds on them and they will send up primocaine from those buds. You don't wanna bury them deep like you would normally plant, transplant something. You need to get them kind of lateral, you know, flat on the ground and then let the cane go up straight. And we'll talk about what to do when you're planting in pots later. So there you go. How to spread them out and then cover them and then you've got, just got the little cane sticking up. So when they grow, when the ever bearings grow, we're gonna get into pruning now. Um, 
if you're there in a hedgerow, meaning that they're all growing together, all their little primocanes are growing together and they're growing, the whole row is growing as one plant. Um, you can cut off all the end ones, all the tips that are outside the, um, the 18 inches that you have given it for that row. Otherwise they will take over the world. So you want a nice hedge, which is why they're called that. And take a look at this. This is what you'll see at the in spring. The dead, this is the old one that grew fruit. And this will give you the early summer one. So in winter or at the end of the season, you can remove this right there. And next spring, you're going to get probably a very light crop here. I don't do that. I don't even bother, but, but I'll talk about that later. Um, so in, in winter, remove those tips. After the harvest in July, remove the canes that died, the ones that gave you the fruit this year that, and cut those out. That's their second year, they're, they're done for. Um, the late fall crop will grow on the new ones that came out this year. However, that's if you want two crops per year. You, they, neither one will be a bumper crop. The later one will be a little bit better than the early one. I cut them down at the end of the year. I only get one harvest. And it's usually around August. And it lasts a long time. So out in my garden, I've got the, the summer bearing, which are like June and early July. And then on my deck, I've got the, um, the everberry. And I, then I get fruit in August and September, actually, and into October. So if, if I were you, the easiest way to manage it is after, every, you know, after they've lost their leaves because it's cold and wintry out there, cut them down to the ground. And believe me, they'll come up nicely the next year. So now at summer bearing, those are fun. Late in summer, and I've got some pictures because this is what I grow mostly. Um, you remove the dead canes that gave you your fruit that year. You remove the flora canes. And you'll be able to tell when you go down to the base of it what they look like. And during the dormant season from January to early March, remove anything that looks bad. Weak, broken, diseased canes and take them all the way down to the soil level. And I did not do that a couple years ago. And what happens is you start getting multiple little floricanes or primocanes coming up out of it. And they're never strong. They're never, you know, going to turn into anything good. So I went back this year and anything I had left there that was a stub, I cut it down to soil level. So next, you want to make sure the row is only 12 inches wide if it's a hedgerow. And in spring, I did this the other day, shorten the canes to about five and a half or six feet tall for easier training and picking. I think I'm going to go at five feet. I think six feet is too tall for me. So, but that's what you, that's what I did last week. So this is what happens after the, you've had your harvest and you can see all this beautiful green growth and you can see these ones that look half dead. Those ones that look half dead are the ones that gave me fruit. That's their second year because last year they were this vigorous green stuff. They were primocanes. This year, they're floricanes and they gave me raspberries. But they're, the cane is done when, it's do when it's done giving me the fruit. So what you'll do is cut those out all the way to the ground. And again, spring pr pruning, you want to remove the canes that need it and then trim it back. And I'll show you. See, this is what I did. That's not good. You want to trim them back right here, right there, right there, right there. But you can see how they look. They're completely different. These are the primate kings. They're nice and green and pretty. These look very different. And if, if you're concerned about it, you can go up and have somebody wiggle the one that looks like it's dying, and you'll know that you're cutting the correct one off. But really, there's no, no doubt about it. These are the old ones. Cut them down to the ground. And this is what they look like afterwards. Don't they look prettier? It's the same one, it's the same row that you saw 
before the floricanes were cut out. And now we've got the parma canes and they look happy. I'm going to, if, if it hadn't been for the weather the following summer, I would have had a really nice crop. Oh, one, one other thing. They tell you to plant the uh, rows like six to eight feet apart. Do it. Mine are too close. And as a result, the ones on the, the row on the east side doesn't do nearly as well because it's shaded by everything else because the rows are too close. So when they tell you eight feet apart, do it. Okay, so. So if you don't know today, if you don't know if you have ever bearing or summer bearing, go out in the spring. And if you see something that looks like a tree at the tip of your um, cane, that means it's uh, a uh, ever bearing. And you, you'll see the tiny new leaf buds coming up here. These are the ones that will give you your spring crop. So you can cut this off. That's in spring. If you see this, it is ever bearing. And you'll leave those on to get a fall crop. In the spring, if you have tall canes with no branching, then, uh, and no, if, if you find canes in the spring that don't have this, and you see little leaf buds along the stem like this, you've got a summer bearing. And the reason we, I'm telling you that is because of how different it is how you prune. Okay, fertilizing. I have not done that yet. I'm going to now because mine look just like this right now. I don't have leaves, leaves but they're starting to come out. So NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The one that we need with our rains on the west side here is nitrogen for the most part because it's washed away. It's very mobile in the soil. Um, the raspberry leaves should look really nice and green like that. If you see pale green or yellow leaves down close to the um, bottom, it may be, it's probably nitrogen deficient or your soil pH could be off. Um, because if the soil pH isn't between, let's say, five, five and a half and seven, then um, it won't be able to use the nutrients. Okay, whoops. So here's what you do if you're in planting in rows. You would use, we can do it either divide it in two or divide it in three. On St. Patrick's Day, mid-March, uh, one half to one ounce of nitrogen per plant out in the rows, or like you can also do three ounces per 10 foot row. Mother's Day, same thing. Father's Day, same thing. That's for new ones. Established plants, it's pretty much one to one and a half per plant or about three ounces per 10 foot row and you broadcast it, you don't stick it around the bottom of it, you, you sprinkle it out so that it's pretty evenly distributed in your uh, row. And here, people get very confused with this, and I was for years. So when you have an NPK of 16, 16, 16, 16% 16 of that bag is nitrogen. 16% of the stuff in that bag is um, phosphorus, 16% it's potassium. So you would take the recommended amount, let's say one ounce, and divide it by 16%, when you change it to a decimal, divide it by 0.16. And you end up with 9.3 ounces, which you would measure on your kitchen scale per established plant. Now, remind uh, the rest of this whole bag of fertilizer is just stuff, it's filler so that you'll be able to distribute it better. So you would, if you're going to put in 1.5 ounces of actual nitrogen, you would get your kitchen scale out and weigh 9.3 ounces per established plant. This is all on the website. So make sure you take a look at this uh, drawing. It, it can get very, very confusing to me because I am math challenged big time. Organic fertile stay, uh, fertilizers stay in the soil longer, but they require more time to be available. So if you're going to use an organic fertilizer, you need to start now because it takes about a month for them to kick in. 
The same thing goes if you're growing in a container. Liquid fertilizers are really fast, but they leach out quickly. But I use a combination of the um, organic fertilizers and the liquid fertilizers all summer long in my pots, not the outside, not the ones in my garden. Okay, let's see, we already talked about that. And then here's some other options. If you're gonna use alfalfa meal, how much you would use if you take 1.5 ounces and divide it by 5%, 0 0.05, you end up with one and three quarters pounds per plant. You can see how it's different for each one. Blood meal is 15, 110. You take 1.5 and divide it by 0.15. So it'd be only be 10 ounces of blood meal and so on. Those are just examples. So watering guide, one inch of water a week. Um, a rule of thumb is three quarters to one gallon of water per square foot of soil surface area. The, in the summer, be very careful. We had a really <laughs> horrible problem last year and my uh, poor raspberries are suffering for it. We thought our drip irrigation was working last summer. For a month and a half, it was not. And things were starting to look really bad. It hurt the raspberries too. They perked up once we started, we fixed the bed, but that's pretty sad. Um, and it's better to water deeply and infrequently. Don't go out and just you know, sprinkle a little bit. Make sure that you water very deeply and then check it between plantings. You, because those roots are so shallow, you don't want it to dry out. Um, drip irrigation is best if you turn the water on. It's best. It helps to reduce weeds, conserves water, and keeps the um, leaves dry. Never water a plant and get the leaves wet. If you're going to water by a hose or something, make sure you aim it toward the bottom, you know, at the crown of the plant. Again, soaker hoses can be used, but you have to check the uh, soil moisture because you don't want it soaking wet or you'll end up with root rot. Okay, containers. They suggest that you don't raise uh, summer bearings in, um, in containers because they're too vigorous. The ever bearings do really well. They're the ones that have the two harvests, the one in spring and then the one in fall. You need a pot or bed at least two feet deep. And that's really a big pot. And my, the ones on my deck are really big. And it's a, like a 20 to 30 pound gallon, rather gallon container. And they should be light colored or white because if you have a black pot and it's sitting on your deck, and the sun hits it, it's gonna cook your roots. Um, the soil medium, one part perlite or vermiculite, one part bark vines, which you can get it, if you live here in, Long, uh, in Longview at Swanson's, or you can get them probably anywhere at a good nursery, and two parts potting soil. If you, you, know, if you don't wanna go that route, you can use potting soil. And you can use those slow release pellets like what, Osmocote, and so it would be eight cups per cubic yard of your soil mix, but eight, a cubic yard is an awful lot of soil, so make sure you do the math. And make sure that the bottom of the pot can drain freely. Don't put it on cement. If you leave it on cement, then it's actually blocking the holes. So put it up on two by fours or something, or put it on um, one of those roller systems where it's open at the bottom, and so they'll be able to uh, drain better. Fertilizing. You can use one of the water, the, you can use a miracle Grow or something like that, or you can, and, and you can um, do it at a very, very slow level. You can do it every week and you can divide it up into your recommended amount of nitrogen into eight or 10, you know, servings if you want to, but don't overdo it. So the new plants would get 0.3 ounces one month and then one month later and then one month later only 0.3 ounces of nitrogen is what they're saying. So you'd have to do the math on that. Establish plants that's just slightly more. Keep the soil evenly moist. Mulch if you can because that'll help it 
to keep the moisture in. And and watch the sun. Our on our deck, I, I have no idea why they burn on our deck when they well, they burn out in the garden too. That sun's really been hot lately. Luckily on the deck I can move them into semi-shade. So we're talking now about the uh oh that that's off the off the thing there. Um we're talking about the everbearing now, the ones that could potentially give you the two harvests. You can prune out the, the ones that gave you the fruit this year, or and you can thin the new primocanes and only let five to eight of those new little green ones stay in there. Or, I, mean, I missed that one. Or you can do what I do. It's the easiest method of taking care of them, and that slide is probably in here somewhere. But just cut them down to the ground in late fall, early winter, you'll get really nice fall harvest next year. So this is what you can see my raspberries there and there. Those are my raspberries. This is in the summer and this is when the heat is really coming down and this is facing west. They, they just get fried. And these are my little columnar apple trees. They do better in the sun, but not great. And then I've got my, oh, do I have that? I've got the um, hydrangeas in there too, and I move them into the shade, but it's really nice to have a way to create shade for your plants if they're on a deck. Luckily, like I said, mine are on um, wheels so I can move them. You may have to create shade in the hottest part of the day. I had a heck of a time trying to keep up with the water needs too. Uh, and in the really, really hot weather, Leaves can wilt, even though the soil is moist. So before you run and get your pot of water, stick your finger in there. If it's moist, let it alone, because it's a the plant's way of conserving moisture. And it just kind of lets the leaves droop. And then come overnight, it'll start perking up again. Weed management is really important because they don't like to compete. You should mulch, keep it away from the crown of the plant. It helps to keep the soil temperatures good. It helps to reduce moisture evaporation. Arborist wood chips, the ones that are left over from when they cut down trees, when the city cuts down trees, are wonderful. Two to three inches. Keep it away from the crown. Always keep the mulch away from the crown. You can use leaves, lawn clippings. I would use aged lawn clip clippings there because the roots are so shallow. And wood shavings, they're also a good choice. I wouldn't use deep straw mulch because we have voles here and they really like that. And again, winter mulch with leaves or straw, I would, it's, you can use shredded leaves. I, that helps your soil. It also helps to protect the crown if you're in a place where it freezes. I don't think anybody, what time is it? Do me a favor and say something in the chat if you want me to go through this. This is all available to you online and the slide deck's there. Do you, you want have, me to talk about it or um, shall we you just- You have 22 minutes until one o'clock. I think you should. We'll okay. just get started on it. Okay. How many of you recognize the picture on the right? This is what all of my raspberries at the tops of the canes on the west side of the westmost row of raspberries looked like. This is sunburn. They, the, uh, it, it burns out the little droplets and it's okay to eat, but those are kind of hard and don't have any taste. But don't be afraid to eat them. There's nothing wrong with them except they're you know responding to how terrible it was. This is a frequent visitor that I've had to the blue green sharp shooter leaf hopper. I'll bet everybody's had that here, at least in Collitz County. I had a lot of them. And then the next year there weren't nearly as many, but I have a Paula, very, very vigorous, flowerful um, pollinator garden that attracts not only pollinators, but lots and lots of beneficial insects. And I think they kept it down. Um, the reason you wanna keep them away, not because they do damage to the leaves, um, but because they can carry viruses and you don't want that. 
Um, this is what glyphosate damage can do. This is on somebody else's raspberry, but I had that on my very own raspberries last year from um, herbicide drift. Um, it was used not even really close to them, but the, the climate conditions were such that the drift just came up and it didn't kill them, but it got some of the tender new growth. And then it came back after that, but beware of that. Hmm. There we go. This is another thing that I did last year when it got really, really hot. The trick is make sure that it's open in the bottom. I covered it like this at the during the hottest part of the day, and then I uncovered it again because if you if you get try to get too tight with those, it creates an oven inside there and it will kill the plants, it'll fry them. But during the hottest part of the day, this will help them. This was my westmost um, row and it, it's the one that suffered. I probably could have gotten away with um, only doing this one. And you see how close they are here? The rows are so close. This row and this row shaded this tiny, short, little stubby row. They're way too close together. And when you um, water, make sure that you do it slowly and deeply. Don't just stand there and just go squirt, 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 squirt. Make sure that you are actually penetrating the soil. Alice, can you share with us what is that stuff you're using? Is that row cover? Thank you. Yeah, that's row cover. You can also get shade fabric. I didn't have any, but row cover works pretty well too. It lets some of the sunshine in, but it, it keeps most of it out. And um, if you use it in your garden, it helps to protect from insects too. And also helps to um, insulate from cold. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have. And if you're in Collins County and coming to our plant sale, you can buy some for super cheap because we bought a huge roll of it and we're dividing it into sections and we're selling it for, I don't know, three bucks, something like that. You can't get it that cheap online and it's good stuff. Okay. I am gonna um, just say a couple of things here and then I'm gonna cut it down. This is the root rot that we get, this Phythophthora root rot. And that's from having wet feet and a raspberry variety that is not resistant to it. Powdery mildew, I haven't seen that be a problem on our side. Um, rust, I've seen that, but it hasn't been too bad. Um, Botrytis is that gray fuzzy stuff that you see on uh, raspberries and strawberries in the grocery store. It's a, a fungus and you'll see that. You can see that on your vegetable or on your fruit too, but only when it's really moist out or you've got, had you know several, several days of overcast and misty weather. Now let me see, brown marmorated stink bug. To me, that is the worst. It, um, let me see if I can find that real quick where that is. And then I want to just real quick go to the spotted wing drosophila because this guy, I hate this guy. This is what the babies look like. Learn to recognize them because you must kill them immediately when you see them. They're, they have little white eggs underneath the leaves. This is what the newest hatchling looks like. And these are some of the later instars or um, after they molt, they turn into these until, and this is, almost ready to become the adult. And this is what the adult looks like. It's got the um, the stripes, the, the banded stripes there and banding around here. And it's also got stripes on the legs. They have a beak that you can't see here. They tuck it underneath their head and down toward underneath their, their abdomen. And they go will go up to your fruit and they will stick that little straw type thing in. They, they unfurl it and it pops up and then they stick it in your tomatoes or your apples. Worst of all is the raspberry. They put in a really nasty tasting enzyme and suck out the juice. And ask me how I know that. Oh my Lord, they're, they're that that if I'm out you know in the garden early in the morning and I pop a raspberry in my mouth if I taste that it comes out within seconds it's awful um you may or may not see a sunken area distorted or shriveled fruit that's usually a couple of days later if it just happened you really can't tell 
So make sure that you watch for these nymphs and the eggs. Get to know what they look like and make sure you get rid of them. Um, the problem, you can shake them out. I haven't had good luck with that because the plantings are very dense um, and you can use pesticides. But it only works on these guys. Once they start getting that little hard shell, you can't do anything. Uh, make sure that you read the label because almost everything that you use should be applied at night when the bees aren't foraging. By morning, they're usually okay and won't hurt the bees. This is the second worst. This is the spotted wing drosophila. They look like little vinegar flies, except they attack ripe fruit and they'll attack plums and cherries. I haven't seen them do it to peaches, but I've heard that they can. Raspberries, and I have a huge raspberry, a black raspberry patch, doesn't everybody, in their backyard. And I'm sure that that's, you know, that's where they're coming from. But they uh, lay the eggs. The female has an ovipositor that they stick into the, like a little needle that they stick into the fruit itself. And they lay the eggs there. And here are the maggots getting ready. They're very tiny. They're very disgusting. If you have, um, if you're concerned about them, if you've seen them flying around, pick out, you know, a good handful of raspberries that are, you know, fairly distributed from where you, you've got your planted. Put them in a, a bowl of very mild saline solution and wait about 15 minutes. If you see these things float to the top, then you've got, you've got spotted wing drosophila maggots. What I do, I shouldn't say, but anyhow, you monitor with vinegar traps. If you find any infested fruit, don't compost it, get rid of it. You can pick fruit regularly every three to four days, get everything ripe off the ground because they'll go to that too. Picking regularly is probably the best thing you can do. There are pesticides that can be used, but they're only effective on these guys, on the adults. They, aren't, they won't touch the ones in the fruit. And again, all are toxic to bees. If you're going to use them, apply at dusk after the bees are done foraging. 